What's going on guys? Hey, welcome back back there in the background behind us. We're going to do our seminar right now, but for the camera purposes here, because you know we got people watching on the interwebs out there, I want to give you guys a little walkthrough. This is our third annual Forever Grateful Fish Life Your Lake Fort Guide. One Tribe Foundation, it's got a lot of names. It's the Forever Grateful Tournament we do every year. Benefits, first responders, and veterans through One Tribe Foundation. We're about to get a seminar kicked off and check out some of our cool items right here. And by the way, for you guys up under the pavilion, we're going to be auctioning some of this off tonight. So you guys want to come take a look at what you might want to place a bid on. We're going to do a seminar, then we're going to have a concert. And in between all that, we're going to interrupt it every once in a while and auction some of these great items off tonight. You guys grab a drink, settle in, have a good time. We're going to be here all night. The temperatures should continue to keep dropping, hopefully, for us. But as you can see, we've got our stage set up here for our concert and everything behind me. All right, this will be our seminar for tonight. i got my man Cody Mays with me. By the way, guys, right now, if y'all take a look up here, please, we've got these red shirts. This is the official tournament shirt for this weekend. By the way, if you weigh in and you win big bass of the tournament and you're wearing this shirt, actually, whoever catches the biggest bass of the tournament wearing this shirt gets a $200 t-shirt bonus. Everybody hear me on that? $200 t-shirt bonus if you're wearing one of these red shirts. So you can buy these shirts for $29, Justin? $29? $29 for this t-shirt. And if you are the biggest one, if you catch the biggest bass of everybody weighing in in this shirt, you get $200 bonus right off the bat. Pretty good deal, huh, Mace? We're going to have to share a microphone. Dude. This is going to get real uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> or real comfortable. I don't know. We'll see how it shakes out. But, uh, man, it's hot, as everybody under the shade can see. It's, it's very hot tonight. Uh, it's been very hot. But one good thing about that is it makes all the fish basically do, for the most part, the same thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Lazy. Lazy. Group of 700 cows. Like we should be. Like everybody under that pavilion is doing. Exactly. Except for Greg Haynes. Greg Haynes is that one fish that leaves the school and wanders way off over there. And you see him on your 360, you're like, what the hell is he doing? I'm That's Greg Haynes. Oh, he's going to the dinner table. I see where he's going. All right. All right. But, uh, yeah, no, it makes the fish do a lot of the same thing. And what it does, it does group them up. It puts them all in one spot. And what that does is offer an opportunity to really capitalize. Now, the real key to success for that is how do you find where they're grouped up at? Like, that's the real deal. I know you've been guiding here for a while now. I know you've been fishing here for a while now. And you've had so much success, especially with tournaments out here before you started guiding. And then they, since you started guiding, you've just taken off like a rocket as far as that goes. Well, what's your biggest key to locating the schools of fish right now? Well, right now all I'm doing is just uh, going out on these points and these ridges where these deep drops are uh, and just using my electronics. So we're um, breaking, breaking the leg down on the avionics map and looking at all those ledges and the creek channels and even the creek bands. Um, you know, like right now we're, we're, we're seeing a lot of fish that are still scattered out. They're starting to group up, but they're still kind of sporadic. Uh, but we are seeing some that are packed in tight. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's, it's just now about to start getting really good. Uh, but yeah, just points, long drawn points, and they're just, uh, not, not so much rope heads or pond ends anymore like it was a few weeks ago. Uh, they've kind of transitioned off of that. So. Yeah, it, it does seem like, it, and here's the thing, they're not always on, like if you've got a point, like that very tip in where the last drop off is on the point or like where the, you know, the position that we would all call the A position by the traditional school of thought. It's not really where they are. Sometimes they are. And a lot of times on these really community type holes, that's where they tend to gather. And that, cause it's easy to find them when they set up where they're supposed to. But what I found is that there's a lot of these fish that set up not where they're really supposed to by the textbook they'll get off the side of the point or they'll get kind of on the flat spot way on up on the point or even out off the end a little bit deeper after it drops off they'll gather there at times and to me what i found is it's just about the hard spots and how to locate a hard spot on offshore structure may be one of the hardest things to understand or to learn how to do and i get asked that question well, how do you find the hard spots well i think you said the key to it is using your electronics you know when you graph a piece of structure guys Graph all of it. I think that's a huge key. Don't just focus on the, the peak of the point as it runs out, but right on the drop off of the ledge, you know, the ridge, whatever you want to call it. Graph around the sides of it. Graph out off of it a little bit. Graph on top of it a little more. Be a little more broad in your search with your electronics. Because in my experience, the key to finding hard spots is finding schools of fish. You may have 
a fish here or a fish there over here, but then you get over here and you've got a little group of five or six or eight of them, well, typically where that group of five or six or eight is grouped up tighter is going to be where the hard spot ends up being in most instances. And from what I've found, anytime I see a good school of fish that's grouped up and positioned, like we all know, the textbook thing that we see where it's dot, 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 and they just look perfect, like they're relating to the bottom but not glued to the bottom, and they're relating to each other but not on top of each other, like they're just perfect. Well, when you see that, every time I see that, it seems like it's a hard spot. Would you agree? Yeah, I agree 100%. Um, you know, also, you know, if you're using your graph, you're not seeing fish on those points. They don't necessarily mean don't fish that point. Uh, I don't know how many times in a week that I pull up to a point that I didn't see no fish, but I know they're there. Um, you know, they're constantly moving back and forth. Just set up and fish it for 10 or 15 minutes to see what happens. Uh, you know, you know, with, you know I, I'm lucky enough to have a Mega 360, so with Mega 360, I can sit there and watch them. And it'll come in and out of the stream, but, you know, for everybody that don't have it, if you don't see the fish, that don't mean don't fish that point. Because uh, they will they will be showing up. But, um, you know, something else I noticed this week is uh, the thunder time is starting to kind of rise. A uh, little bit. Today, uh, me and Jacob Bell went out, and um, I don't know, I can't remember exactly what you call them. I call them jellyfish. Uh, you may call them something else. They're, they're actually called a bryozoan colony. <laughs> I'm not as dumb as I seem. Well, I am. But only in certain, like, I'm dumb in certain ways. But then I'm smart in other ways, right? At least that's what mom, my mom's here somewhere. She told me that when I was a kid, so. Well, I'm going to continue calling freshwater jellyfish, but. Yeah. Uh, anyways, uh, we, we actually seen some of those today. Um, so, you know, that's telling me that that kind of kind of is rising and it's starting to kind of, the lake's about to start turning over from what I've been seeing, uh, which is kind of early compared to last year. I don't know. Well, let, let me disagree with you a little bit there. So. I don't think that means the lake's going to turn over. I, I think as long as the temperatures continue to rise in the water column, it's not going to turn over. The thermocline will set up harder and harder and harder, and sometimes the thermocline will move shallower, will move higher in the water column. So right now it's setting up in 22 foot of water. Well, the hotter the water can get, that thermocline may climb to 18 foot of water. Um, now, the turnover won't happen until the water starts cooling when we start transitioning towards fall. So when we start getting our first cold fronts and the water starts cooling, once the water cools down enough to where the surface temps equal the water temperature of the deeper temps, then the lake will start to turn. You know, that's kind of what I was thinking with this cooler weather that we kind of had this last week, you know, with these cooler mornings. That's kind of what I was thinking that may have happened, you know, a little bit. Yeah, I guess just that's the place where we disagree. I just don't, I don't see the water temps cooling off enough to initiate the actual turnover process. Um, I think sometimes when you see those bryozoan colonies, freshwater jellyfish, man, unless you're seeing a whole bunch of them, like you see a whole bunch of them, yeah, that's turnover. But if you're seeing a couple, you know, the deal is with those is they just, they attach themselves to cover near the bottom. So they attach themselves to a piece of standing timber, a root ball, a lay down, whatever. Well, if you get a good windy day or a good rainstorm that makes some current flow or something like that, like that can knock some of those loose where you'll see them. But to me, the sign of a turnover, in my opinion, is whenever you see a bunch of those and the water color drastically changes all of a sudden and you get a lot of the frothing and the, the bubbles on the top the white foamy stuff uh, all over the main lake you know those are all indicative of turnover signs to me not just some brise on colonies i think some of the bottom gets disturbed one way or the other at times you know unless you're seeing a massive amount i don't really start worried about turnover you know? sorry man we just agree to disagree can we can't agree on everything like I think you're extremely ugly. See, we do agree. We agree. agree. We agree on certain things. That's good. That's good. We agree on certain things. That's good. Where, hey, Billy, where is the thermocline right now? Is the one set up? I wasn't out this morning. He was, so he'll have the latest info on that. Uh, so this morning, uh, first off, it was probably about 30 foot. Um, it was pretty deep. And then once it kind of started getting a little hotter in the day, it started pushing back down. But... Uh, it was a big difference than what it was last week. It started rising a little bit more. So. This is the initial, and I saw some earlier this week. I was on the water Monday through Thursday, and then this big event that we do, you know, it's a big undertaking, coordinating all this. So, um, you know, we, I had to take a couple days off. I had to take yesterday today off to get everything ready for this. But Monday through Wednesday, actually by Wednesday, I was starting to see some very deep signs of thermocline. Now, I will say this. It went right in my head and right out. And the reason why is it was so deep 
that it, I wasn't fishing that deep. Like the deepest I'm fishing is about 22, maybe 23 feet at times in the afternoons. In the morning I'm fishing usually 15 to 20 or even shallower at times. Uh, so when I saw that it was down there close to that 30 foot range, it just went in my head and right out. See, I, I do know certain things that make me sound smart, but I try to keep things real simple because I, I can't process too much information. So if this don't affect me, we're just not going to think about it. You know what I mean? Like we're just going to block that out. So, so that's kind of how I, I work on that deal. So I just forgot about the thermocline altogether because it wasn't affecting me. But all the thermocline does, guys, it actually helps you. So right now we've got low water conditions on Lake Fork. Everybody knows that we're about six foot low, give or take or so. And with those low water conditions, well, that gives the fish less water to be in, to operate in, to, you know, they just don't have as much room to spread out. So that helps group them up. It also eliminates a lot of our shallow cover in the lake. So what that does is that forces the majority of the fish to resort to deeper water offshore structure throughout the summertime during the hot temperatures. They don't have shady, flooded grass mats on the bank to get under. They don't have hydrilla and coontail flats to get oxygenated on and hang out on throughout the summer. So they're all going to the offshore structure for the most part. Um, as that thermocline kicks in, it climbing is actually a very good thing. Because so right now I'm catching fish in anywhere from 23 foot of water to 10 foot of water throughout the day at different times, right? Well, that thermocline climbs all the way up to 17 or 18 foot. It just eliminated five foot of the water column. Because those, I don't fish for fish under a thermocline. I've heard some guys say they've caught some fish under the thermocline. I don't think, it, it doesn't work for me. I don't catch nothing under there. And the science of the thermocline is basically that level where it sets up at from there down in the water column is a very low oxygen level in the water at that depth and down. So I don't think those fish want to be down there. They don't, and if they are down there, they're not going to be very active. They're not going to feel good. They're going to feel like they're choking to death, really, you know, because they're not getting oxygen. So I always fish right at the thermocline and above it. So if I get a thermocline to come up to 18 foot, I don't have to look at anything deeper than 18 foot. It just makes the lake that much smaller. It makes It narrows down that much areas that I don't have to look, and now it makes it easier for me to locate fish. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Anyway, we got a couple guys. All right, makes sense. Good. Is it? thinks it's turning over already. Yeah. Yeah. Start to. <laughs> Is there any questions out there? We do like to do questions in these. If you guys have any questions, just holler them out at any time. Did everybody, was everybody here to hear about the t-shirt bonus? If you didn't hear about the t-shirt bonus, uh, this is the official shirt for the tournament this year, this red shirt I'm wearing. All the fine people over here from Lunch Out Foundation are wearing them behind the uh, merch booth. Everybody way over there in the merch booth. See over there in the merch booth? All right, so if you guys get one of these t-shirts, it costs $29. Whoever catches the biggest bass and weighs it in wearing this shirt tomorrow, $200 bonus for that alone. And then if you win Big Bass, you win the Big Bass pot as well, of course. Tell you what, Cody, if you don't mind, is Cord Hutkins around? <laughs> Come on up here, Cord. I'm going to bring my buddy Cord Hutkins up here. I had a couple of questions I wanted to pick his brain about. Cody, you said the turnover was already happening, so I kicked you out. I said it's starting. Huh? I wouldn't even listen. I bet I would be looking at this thing. Turnover already happened. Yeah. So this is my buddy, Court Huckins. He's been down here guiding, what, about a year now, huh? Yeah, About a year. He, he fishes all over the region doing the tournament thing. He's from Oklahoma. But, man, I did, I wanted to ask you this. So you've been kind of living in Lake Fork for about a year, maybe a little over, and guiding out here. And, and of course, still traveling to the tournament thing, but this has been your home base now for a year. What specifically about Lake Fork have you learned over the past year that might help some of these people? This is the toughest place you'll ever fish in your life. I promise you. I've been all over. You go up north, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. Here, I tell everybody it is feast or famine on Lake Fork. I don't care how good you are or whatever. It's tough, but. Most of it's timing. I learned so much about timing and how to, what periods of the day, where to be at what times. And some days you're a hero and some days they, you, you lack a little bit. You know, it's your timing gets off. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if you miss it, you know, and it's been times where you can pull up and you'll catch one or two real quick and it'd be gone. And you probably caught the last five minutes of that 30 minutes an hour window. So uh, that's probably the biggest thing that I've learned so much about is that how much timing matters in this lake. Do you think fishing this lake with, you know, you know, these fish are difficult to catch for a few reasons. Number one is obvious, the pressure. The pressure per acre, there's no other destination lake on earth 
you, when, when I say destination lake, I mean lakes that people travel to, right? Like, so for us here, this is home. But if we're going to travel, we're going to go to Toledo Bend, or we're going to go to Rayburn, or we're going to go to Gunnersville, or Okeechobee, or, you know, Toho, Kissimmee Chain, you know, California Delta, Clear Lake, all these destination lakes, those big name lakes, which fork is every bit of a big name, if not bigger than any of those. They're, guys, they're all like 100,000 acres or bigger. <laughs> None of them are under about 80,000. I think Falcon's the smallest one, about 80,000 acres. Lake Fork is 27,000 acres at full point. It's so much smaller. So the pressure per acre that these fish get is just unbelievable. But on top of that, very heavy Florida strain influence here. Florida strain fish are much more finicky than other bass on northern strain bass. Like you said up north, like cheetah fish and barrel. Um, and then the last thing is the bait source. When you talk to biologists that survey this lake, they'll tell you there's nowhere on earth that has more bait per acre in it than this lake right here. So these fish are moody, like your ex-girlfriend that's mean. They're full all the time. They never have to eat. They can eat whatever they want. And they get more pressure than any fish on a big lake anywhere else. That's what makes them so difficult. So. That being said, the difficulties of the fish to catch here, you fishing here for a year, and then also the, the tools you learn with the timing aspect, how much do you think that's helped you when you travel and go somewhere else? You know, like it plays in a lot of places, but it, it helps in a way of like, some places you don't have to fish like fork. Fork, you can camp on spots and be productive sometimes all day long, or you can do you know a two or three spot rotation within a half mile and be productive all day and you can sit on each spot for an hour and catch a handful of fish and it may be 30 minutes between bites and other lakes are like that too but a lot of times you don't have to do that you know because just like you said they're not as fed as well or there's not as much pressure you know if i go to rayburn and go fish there's sometimes i can go and go practice for three or four days and go fish all day tournament and maybe see two boats within three quarters of a mile or a mile from where all my juicy spots are. Here, you go on a Saturday anytime and you're gonna see 50 boats anywhere you sit. I mean, you probably see, oh, I see boats running right now. You know what I mean? And like, it just makes it so tough. And sometimes it's nice fishing the big lakes because you can get away from people. And then sometimes the bite is the one thing and you just gotta get in the crowd with everybody else, which, do you think Lake Forks makes you a better fisherman well, on the road, or no, you think it gives you bad habits? Um, it's kind of 50-50, to be honest. Like, at certain times, I will say it, it helps me get the mentality of how a big fish thinks, you know, especially from somebody that came from Oklahoma. I was born and raised in Oklahoma. We don't have near the numbers of you know, the six to seven plus pound fish per acre of any lake. You know, you hear all the pro stock. Texas any lake in texas you got a shot at the 10 plus anywhere you go yeah. oklahoma that's pretty rare i mean you've got to hit the small lakes and be live sonar you know all the time you know you got to be a josh jones of oklahoma essentially if you want to go catch that kind of fish so it it's helped me being here all the time and chasing the big fish and understanding how they react to baits where they set up versus you know, your two to four pound fish, that six to eight pound fish, how they're going to act, where they'll suspend at, and, you know, you kind of get that different mentality that I've really never had before versus just used to Oklahoma, you can go beat the bank for eight hours, and you can go fill a 15 pound limit pretty easy. You know, you can't do that in Texas. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's been a thing over the years if you follow the professional level tours that you see when a guy graduates from Lake Fork, right? Yeah. That's what I call it. When a guy breaks through and gets to the top level of tournament fishing from Lake Fork, and you could go back and, you know, Kelly Jordan obviously is from here. Uh, Dean Rojas cut his teeth here. He lived in Grand Saline when he broke through, and, and for the first several years that he was on tour. Um, Takahiro Amori, uh, Lee Lewis, he's the most recent one, right? So uh, you look at these guys, and you look at their track record on the professional tour, and every one of them, you know what you hear about them? Man, they're the hero or zero guy. Now they catch more big fish. You know, you've got uh, Kelly's got one more big bass at professional level tournaments than anybody in the history of sport, yeah. right? Dean Rojas has the all-time best five bags still to this day. Uh, Takahiro is known, like the guys on tour call him Lucky, joking with him, they call him Lucky, this, that, and the other, right? And, and because he gets these lucky big bites all the time, you know? And, and so these guys that come from Lake Fork, they just have a knack 
when you fish all the time, it teaches you how to catch big ones and how they behave. It does. Well, Cord, man, I appreciate you coming up here. Right now, I think I see Jake Schick. I want to bring Jake Schick up. Jake, is your official title the founder, the president? What do we call you? The man. The legend. The head honcho. All right, so this weekend is all about One Tribe Foundation. It's about our love for the sport, and it's about us having a good fellowship with each other, having a good time in a family-friendly environment and all that good stuff. But at the core of it, what we're doing this for and what it gives back to is One Tribe Foundation. And the guy that heads all that up is sitting directly to my left right now. This is Mr. Jake Schick. Let's give him a big round of applause for everything One Tribe Foundation does. Jake, we got to share a microphone. How do you feel about that? If you weren't both Marines, I'd be against it. <laughs> that is true. We share a little different bond than most humans do. That's for sure. But, uh, yeah, so, th so Jake, man, One Tribe Foundation does so many great things. But for anybody that doesn't kind of know how this thing came about and what really the core belief system, the core mission statement of the company is, why don't you break us down for us and let us know what One Tribe is all about. So uh, a lot of people know us as uh, how we started in, in 2013 as 22 Kill. And that was started because of a study that came out from the VA in 2012 that stated on average 22 veterans die by suicide every day. Since then, the number has been, uh, the latest number is around 20. But uh, we knew early on that once the, the anyone here the 22 push-up challenge, we did that. That started in 2013, went viral in 2016. So overnight success three years later. Uh, after The Rock did it. But that thing happened all over the world. And, and we had battalions, literally the battalion and regiment level doing these push-up challenges. We had them in Australia the UK, South Korea, even at Iceland, doing, and I mean, entire brigades doing these push-up challenges in uniform. And I remember I contacted Sergeant Major Marine Corps and I said, hey, Sergeant Major, we got a bunch of these, I mean, granted, they're our allies, but showing us up, we need to do something. And he said, man, Jake, I'd love to do it, but it's against military policy. So I said, okay, well, because of, as Marines, we don't really take too kindly to somebody tell us something good against policy, do we, Jake? There's a reason I'm medically retired 16 page 11s. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and the only reason I got promoted to corporal is because I'm pretty sure Tom and Haiti thought I was going to die. <laughs> so he said, make this Marine corporal. <laughs> That's a true story. Because I was not promotable because I had signed a page 11 before we left 29 pounds. Yeah. And, for, and you're not supposed to get promoted for 12 months. I've never signed any of that kind of paperwork ever. Yeah, no, I never rebuttaled. I signed a bunch of them, though. Uh, but, you know, we learned early on after the, the push-up challenge, we knew that the suicide epidemic was a thing amongst the warrior class. We'd already buried brothers. You and I talked about it long before that study came out. And, uh, I mean, hell, we battled our own demons. been pretty honest Still about do. it. Still do. Still do. Yeah, it's an ongoing evolution. But that's the whole idea behind it, is, is creating community that needed to raise awareness to an epidemic that was affecting our warriors and uh, affecting the reason that we get to celebrate this Monday. And that, and that was the idea behind it. But since then, in 2017, I went to a conference and heard that uh, every 18 hours, a law enforcement officer dies by suicide. And I heard every eight hours, firefighter, paramedic, EMT. And so I remember telling the board, I was in the board meeting, I said, look, we've got to offer everything we offer for our vets and our military and our families these first responders and law enforcement officers and I mean they didn't tell me no but they said not right now and I didn't agree and so uh, I called Fox News and then set it up for the New York City slot New York City Fire Department to come on Fox and Friends on live television to do the push-up challenge and I said everything we offer for military and vets we're now offering for first responders and law enforcement officers my cell phone was in my pocket and started immediately. immediately. And so I figured, well, I'm, not, I'm in trouble, but if they fire me, either way, I win in this situation. And so uh, that's how we got into the realm of first responder, law enforcement officer, and then, of course, global pandemic, uh, in case any of you forgot. It's kind of a big deal. And that is how we got into frontline healthcare workers because we realized 
I read a lot of statistics that they were just taking on the chin and uh, we started losing them. And so, and not to mention, uh, I got some people pretty close to me and my family that are frontline healthcare workers and I was a patient and I use that word very loosely for 18 months and I know how much of a pain in the ass I was. So uh, I was never, never trained how to be a severely wounded Marine, just Marine. And uh, so since then we, we've developed and, and evolved into a full blown mental and emotional wellness organization. And it was started by a few knuckle draggers like us and now it's technically run by a lot of people that are a lot smarter than me. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> and uh, we've, we've evolved and we've grown and the reason we transitioned over to One Trap Foundation is because look, I learned this a long time ago. Uh, these are human issues. I mean, these aren't just warrior issues, first responder, LEO, frontline healthcare worker, family members. These are human issues across the board. And then we learned during the global pandemic that there's a large difference between being lonely and alone. Those are two different things. And a lot of people realize that. And so our, our client intake, just for our traditional therapy program, went up over 200% in one year. You know, and, and so we're, we're actively trying to figure out ways how, how to reduce that waiting list and get these people the help they need because again, we serve the families as well. You gotta treat the whole unit. And so that's where we are now. We get to do cool events like this, thanks to guys like Billy, and, and come out here in this tropical weather, as my gunny used to call it. It's tropical, gents, that's what he would say. Like, no gunny, it's hot as hell. But uh, I wouldn't say that. Uh, but, but, yeah. That's where I did my work up, 29 Palms. It was hot as hell there. You know the one place that sucks worse than 29 Palms? The Sunni Triangle in Iraq. I got there and I was like, damn, I miss 29 Palms. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, man, we're honored to be here. We couldn't, we can't do the stuff we do on a daily basis. And trust me when I tell you, I mean, you see, you see my niece and her friend volunteering, selling some, some merchandise, but... We can't do what we do on a daily basis because there is no nine to five in this line of work. It is an all day, every day thing. And so we really appreciate the support and you guys coming out and being a part of this. It means a lot to us. And uh, you know, this is epitome in one tribe right here. This is epitome of being tribe like. Because you can turn on any, any radio channel, any TV channel and get all the negativity and the agenda driven bullshit you want. But you look around you here and realize this is what's everything that's good about this country and great about this country. So we really appreciate you guys. Absolutely. Yep, clap it up. Yeah, that's that's what this is all about this weekend. And Jake said it's because of guys like me. I want to, you know, with all due respect, as they say, right? I want to correct him on that because it's not me. Like, I'm just the little puppet up here doing my dance but it's y'all it's every one of y'all it's every one of y'all behind that camera that support the channel that help build this platform that allows us to reach out and gather as a tribe and, and, and create this change for good in, in, a, in a community that deserves all of our utmost respect you know me and jake are fortunate and i see so many other guys in this crowd i know ben shelton's a marine as well right there in front of me gary payne right directly in line with him is a marine as well so I know so many of you guys in, in this crowd are a part of this community, but um, I know me and Jake feel so fortunate to have been a part of that community. The one thing that I know, it deserves every bit of respect we can give it because no matter how bad these politicians try to screw this country up, and they are working hard at it. They're right? good at it, too. They're working They're hard at it. it hey, but in spite of all that, this land is free, and it's because of these people that me and Jake were lucky enough to serve with and beside it because of our first responders and our healthcare workers and really just the free civilians of this country that keep going to work and doing everything the right way. The vast majority of this country does things the right way and that's why we love it and we want to do everything we can to help it. And from me and Jake's experience, personal experience and perspective, this mental health aspect in our veteran and first responder community is so important. Uh, nobody's the same once you go through the training, even just the training, let alone the combat experience. Your mind doesn't function the same. And that creates some difficulties to overcome throughout your life, mentally. And so that's why this work is so important and so near and dear to my heart, to my Jake's dedicated his life to it. And we cannot thank all of you guys enough for helping us to make this deal a successful event and help them carry that mission down the road and accomplish it. Thank you guys.
Matt, you about ready back there? All right, buddy, start climbing up and getting ready. We're fixing to turn this one off and get yours going here in a minute. What's up? A what? A whack report? Oh, you need, You want to come to a whack report? Yeah. Zemo says they're still buying the wacky worm because it's all he's going to throw.